today on the Perception in Action podcast. What exactly do we mean by the term muscle memory? And does it fit at all within the ecological approach to skill? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Now on to the show. Today, I wanna just briefly cover the topic of muscle memory. This is something I get asked about fairly often. How does muscle memory fit into the ecological approach? When I got asked about it recently, I went to look for an episode I could point the person to and realize I didn't have one. Although I've covered it somewhat in episode 326 when looking at automaticity and in episode 359 when looking at habits versus skills and introducing the concept of being mindful, I haven't covered the concept in detail. But I think this ubiquitous term definitely deserves its own episode. For this episode, I'm going to look at the very interesting 2012 book chapter by Richard Schusterman with the fantastic title, Muscle Memory and the Somostatic Pathologies of Everyday Life. Schusterman starts the chapter by giving a definition of muscle memory that I think captures the concept well. Quote, Muscle memory is a term commonly used in everyday discourse for the sort of embodied, implicit memory that unconsciously helps us to perform various motor tasks we have somehow learned through habituation, either through explicit intentional training or simply as the result of informal, unintentional, or even unconscious learning from repeated prior experience. In scientific terminology, such memory is often designated as procedural memory or motor memory because it enables us to perform various motor procedures or skills in an automatic or spontaneous fashion without conscious deliberation of how the procedure should be followed without any explicit calculation of how one identifies and achieves the various steps involved in the procedure and how one proceeds from step to step. Paradigmatic of such muscle memory motor skills of performance are walking, swimming, riding a bicycle, tying one's shoes, playing the piano, driving a car, or typing a keyboard. Because these skills apparently rely on schema or patterns deeply embedded in an individual central nervous system, the core engine of memory in so-called muscle memory is not simply the body's muscles, but instead also involves the brain's neural network. However, we use the term muscle or motor to suggest the body in contrast to the mind. That is that the movement requires less mental effort, or as Schusterman puts it, muscle memory conveys a sense of mindless memory. End quote. This, of course, is an idea that comes straight from traditional theories of skill acquisition, such as Fitz and Posner's three-stage model, where the goal of training is to reduce the attentional and working memory load required to perform the skill by developing motor programs, schemas, etc. that can run automatic without conscious deliberation. I think it's fair to say that when we use the term muscle memory, we're trying to capture the idea that once something is in muscle memory, it's automatic. This is the highest stage of skill in these traditional theories. He then goes on to say, quote, Muscle memory conveys a sense of mindless memory. Such memory is mindless, however, only if we identify mind with mindfulness in the sense of explicit, critically focused, conscious, or deliberate reflective awareness. Procedural or performative tasks of implicit memory often require and exhibit significant mental skills and intelligence, as for example when a good pianist plays with spontaneity, yet also with aesthetically sensitive mindfulness. In demonstrating that intelligent mind extends beyond clear consciousness, muscle memory also makes manifest the mind's embodied nature and the body's crucial role in memory cognition. He continues, Though the habits and skills of such memory are typically very welcome and useful, We also develop bad habits of muscle memory, many of which go unnoticed not only because of their implicit character, but also because their detrimental effects are usually not so extreme as to call our conscious attention to them. Schusterman then goes on to discuss six forms of muscle memory. Number one, perhaps the most basic implicit memory is that of oneself, the implicit sense of continuing personal identity. When I awake in the morning, even before I open my eyes, I have the implicit memory of being the same person that went to sleep the night before. Number two, a second crucial mode is remembering where one is, and very often the memory includes implicit recalling how one gets from where one is to where one wants to go. One's body, of course, supplies the primordial point, the center of origin of coordinates, by being what locates us in space and gives that lived space its directionality. 
Number three, a third form of implicit memory with deep bodily grounding might be described as interpersonal. Did you ever notice that though you've shared with your spouse or longtime partner countless beds and countless bedrooms, you always seem to lie together in the same orientation on the same side of the bed? These habitual postures are assumed without thinking about them and they establish a feeling of comfortable familiarity. Number four, our interpersonal relationships take us place within a larger social setting. But if interpersonal implicit memory in some way already implies the social, we can also distinguish a more distinctly social form of implicit memory in terms of inhabiting, recalling, or replaying distinctive social roles. Number five, the fifth type of muscle memory he identifies is the one most relevant to skill acquisition, performative or procedural memory. Normally, we do not think about how to dress or undress ourselves. We typically do not know which sock or shoe we put on first, which arm or leg is first inserted into a sleeve or trouser, which button is, is buttoned first, and whether the buttoning we use the index or pointing finger with the thumb. This muscle memory is certainly most efficient by allowing us to direct our always limited resources of explicit consciousness to other places that need it. We can thus concentrate our attention on the ideas we are writing rather than thinking of the location of the letters on the keyboard when we want to type. I can look down the basketball court to see if a teammate is open near the basket rather than having to think about how I handle the ball to dribble and then pass to them. By freeing our consciousness to engage in other things, muscle memory extends our range of attention and perception and thus enhances our freedom of action. With many complex motor skills, moreover, it's often claimed by philosophers, psychologists, and movement experts, if we tried to perform them explicitly, recalling and deliberating at each step, we would awkwardly stumble. As the great choreographer George Belench would tell his dancers, don't think, dear, just do. The last kind of implicit memory I note here is an unhappy one of unfreedom, traumatic memory. Pain is implicitly remembered in the body and projected through into future attitudes as proverbs like once bitten, twice shy suggest. The last section of the paper is where it really gets interesting for me. It's titled, Somesthetic Pathologies of Muscle Memory and Their Treatment. Quote, there's not space here to treat all the different ways that insufficient somesthetic awareness, i.e. the inadequate perception of our somatic compartment and feelings, leads to minor everyday problems of dysfunction, error, discomfort, pain, or decline for proper efficiency. These include unnecessary self-induced accidents like biting one's tongue when eating, tripping over one's feet, choking by swallowing food or drink down the wrong pipe, hurting one's back or knee by lifting or turning in the wrong position, straining one's lower back by not noticing the discomfort experiencing and having sat too long at one's workstation. Then there are the everyday somestatic pathologies involved in a variety of malfunctions in, in sports-related skills, like failing to hit a ball properly in tennis, golf, or baseball, because one is unaware that one's eyes, hands, and other body parts are not in the right position for making contact. We also find similar motor malfunctions in work-related activities, such as mistakenly clicking on a mouse when not really ready to send one's message, or other errors arising for not being sufficiently aware of one's handling of the computer keyboard or one's cell phone touch screen. Other common somesthetic problems include not being able to sleep because one is not aware that one's breathing is too short and one's body too tensely held to induce a condition of repose that can induce sleep. Implicit performative or procedural memory is indispensable for getting us efficiently through countless everyday activities by enabling us to perform so many familiar tasks with no explicit detention. It allows us to direct our limited resources of attention, attentive consciousness to more difficult problems. As noted earlier, a writer can focus on how to express his philosophical ideas and instead of how to position his hands and flex and move his fingers to perform the necessary actions for pressing the right keys to generate the letters or words he wishes. A violinist can likewise concentrate on the expressive quality she wants to produce rather than the way she's gripping her instrument and positioning or moving her shoulders, torsos, and arms when performing. In the same way, a DJ can concentrate on the songs or tracks he's sampling rather than on the posture of his rib cage and hips when he's spinning those records. In these and similar cases, their muscle memory performs the necessary sequential acts of muscle contraction, positioning, and movement without explicit consciousness. Unfortunately, however, as I've learned from clinical practice, the habits of muscle memory formed to perform such spontaneous body adjustments often do so in ways that are not somatically advantageous and lead to unnecessary fatigue, pain, or injury. The writer develops carpal tunnel syndrome from holding his wrist too rigidly. The violinist suffers pain in the back, neck, and arms because she holds her shoulders and ribcage too tight, thus forcing her bow strokes to be more effortful. 
So to sum up, I don't think the concept of muscle memory in the general sense of making a skill not involve mental effort is really a useful one in an ecological approach. The idea that you pass through a stage of, of explicit con control of actions, then you develop motor programs and schema, then you get to automaticity does not fit at all with how we think skill involves in, in, motor, in the ecological approach. In the ecological approach, right, we're educating our attention to new information, developing new relationships with our environment, which requires attention all the time. Not in the traditional sense of attention, that the high cognitive, low conscious attention, but in the ecological approach of attention and cognition. Right, so the way the the thing that quote that sums this up for perfectly for me is the one I had in, in my book from Tim Ingold. Learning is about attending to things rather than acquiring the knowledge that absolves us of the need to do so. Right, so motor memory is this idea that we can develop these schema, these reflexes, these motor programs that frees us from paying attention to what's going on in the world around us. Right, in the ecological approach, we do not think that's what we're trying to achieve. Right, establishing and maintaining and being aware of what's around you is what you need to be skillful. And I think I won't go into all the detail of this, but you could also see in, in some of Schusterman's writing the downside of developing motor motor memories, muscle memory at automaticity is that it's very dumb. The skill is dumb. It becomes a habit that is not sensitive to, at all to the changing constraints around you. That's why you make simple, dumb errors of biting your tongue when you're eating food, right? You don't have the sensitivity to the changing constraints that you get when you have real skill, when you become really in tune to your environment. So there are some thoughts on muscle memory. I know it's still kind of a persistent concept. Yes, things change as you learn, right? You, and uh, the, the theory that in the ecological approach we use is direct learning. The information you use, the t part of the movement you control, the control laws, the calibration. Yet that changes as we learn but I don't think the concept of muscle memory captures it very well. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coaches meetup, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone through San Luis.